Aloha. I'm Karina Lyons, Vice President and Director of Research at the East West Centre and host of East West Centre Insights. The Centre is a cutting edge research and capacity building institution and we're based here in Hawaii and our mission is to forge a deeper understanding and connection between the East and the West. So every two weeks on this show, which is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Hawaii time, I have a conversation with an East West Centre expert or a guest from our global network about critical Asia Pacific issues. So check us out at eastwestcenter.org slash insights. So today's guest is Michael Singh, who is the Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, otherwise known as TICO, right here in Honolulu. And that office serves as the representative office of the Republic of China, Taiwan in Hawaii. Director General Singh joined Taiwan's Foreign Service in 1986, gosh, you look so young, <laughs> as a career <laughs> diplomat and previously served as ambassador to the Republic of Palau in 2016 and 2018. And he's been the Director General of TICO in Honolulu since April 2018. And as you can tell, uh, we go way back. So hello, Director General, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Karina. Uh, very happy to be here, thank you. Really good to, to see you and I should probably explain my um, informality. We both served as um, ambassadors uh, for our country, so Palau at the same time. So um, the last, it feels like the last time we actually got to meet in person, um, it was in that beautiful country, but here we are in this beautiful country. So I'm gonna kick us right off um, by staying in the reality of the coronavirus. And um, we've talked about this before, but Taiwan has been one of the world's leaders in countering COVID-19. So can you give us a, an update on the current status in Taiwan? Yes, um, I think we had done a pretty good job uh, in containing the COVID-19. Until today, we have only 499 cases and seven deaths, Consider considering it's uh, 23.6 million people and very close to mainland China, when some of the research institutes say that we're going to be one of the worst hit country in the world, it may turn out to be we are one of the best. So uh, we are happy. Uh, what we had only two weeks delay of the school opening in February, only that, and we had no lockdowns at all. So uh, our economy is pretty good. The second quarters of our economy. Uh, according to an Oxford University scholar using the OECD data, we're number mm -hmm. one in the world. We only had minus 0.6%. Uh, so a decrease, not increase, of course. And com comparing to South Korea, minus three, Japan minus 10, Singapore minus 13, and UK minus 21%. So uh, mm -hmm. we're doing pretty good. Yeah. And um... Given that we're currently in lockdown right here, I, I really seized on the fact that you said that businesses were operating and schools are actually in session. So, you know, what are some of the factors that have led to that success? And are there any lessons for other countries or for us here in Hawaii? Yes, um, I think uh, there are a few reasons that we've been successful. First of all, of course, of our you know, we Taiwan have uh, one of the best uh, public health system. Uh, anybody who went there. Uh, will know how good our system is. And also the second factor is that 2003, we had a SARS hit. SARS hit us really hard. We got 73 people passed, to, passed away of the pandemic. And so people knew very well what kind of uh, respiratory uh, uh, contagious disease would be, would be like. And government also immediately set up a very strong uh, mechanism to deal with the future, that kind of uh, outbreak, uh, mm -hmm. or just contingency. And I think politically, I, I would say, um, because we know China too well, they, in the very early stage, they try to hide the information, the outbreak, but we knew we got information from on the mainland and um, we did not trust what their official statements was and we just took action very quickly. So that is one, one of the major reasons that we took early action. And also I think that during the whole process of the pandemic, it's important that the government 
keeps a very good, constant, trans transparent communication with the people. And our health minister holds the press conference live every single day for more than four months. Wow. Just to make sure that people understand uh, what the situation they're in. So any questions that the people will ask or any media might ask, they just you know, get, can get all the answers that they, that they're from, from the minister. So uh, this kind of transparent communication really cultivated the trust between the government and the public. So mm -hmm. uh, it really saves a lot of um, opportunity cost and also reduce the public public panic over the over the, this kind of disease. So um, yes, mm -hmm. government is trying to teach to tell the people the enemy is not a patient. The enemy is the virus. So everybody should have that kind of clear mindset to targeting the virus, and so as to spare a lot of efforts, right, right, and pointing fingers to each other. Mm -hmm. I think that is really important. I wouldn't say this last, but I think it's one of the most important factors is the face masks. Mm -hmm. The face masks, if you, if you see the Asian countries, like Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, even China, Hong Kong, uh, we wear masks a lot. We don't think wearing a mask is a some kind of offending behavior to other people because mm -hmm. we think, especially during this pandemic, especially when those asymptomatic patient carriers, they don't know they are, they are the carriers. If you wear a mask, it's your, it's actually, actually it's a sort of respect to other people. So um, we really pump up our production from daily production of uh, 1.8 million pieces to 20 million pieces a day within two months. Uh, that was a joint effort between our industry and the government. And the purpose is I want to make sure that people, the people, everybody has a must wear. And so as to, to really, you know, it cut down the possibility of that kind of transmission. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's interesting you uh, stressed uh, transparency and communication as being a key to, to the success. and. Uh, the last show we had Dr. Tim Brown, who's an epidemiologist at the, um, at the East West Center, and he also stressed um, uh, clear communication as being one of the, the key factors in the successful jurisdictions such as Taiwan and, and New Zealand. Um, but uh, and I'm, that's such a, it's just a welcome relief to hear good news um and so i like to when there are success stories i do like to um to, to hear about to hear about that uh but the main reason i invited you uh, on today was to talk about the you know the view from taiwan in the pacific context mm -hmm. and um i was hoping that you could explain what taiwan's new southbound policy is and how it overlaps with the u.s indo-pacific strategy all right uh so i, I use you know, just quickly go over some of the points I think I... In plain I, English, please, for, <laughs> for people who aren't <laughs> experts. I think the uh, Taiwanese New South Bond policy and the U.S. Uh, so, so the open, the free and open uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, they are all focused on the stre strengthening the ties with the countries within the re region. And I think that those two strategies has at least three convergence, three areas of convergence. The first one I would, I can't really, uh, you know, uh, emphasize that enough is the good governance. The good governance, the shared democratic values of principles, and that is really the core of the these two strategies. I think um, between U.S. and Taiwan, we have a very strong vital common denominator of the good governance that is a democracy, and because at the end of the day. What's, what's the most important to, a, to an individual? You have to be your own boss of your life. And you want to be free to choose your own faith, right? You want to be free of expression. I mean, I mean free, freedom of speech. And you also want to be free from any coercion. 
So uh, that is the thing, that is the core essence of our values in these two strategies. The second, the second part, of course, is the security. You have no security, you can't really um, make sure that, you know, the development, the regional development has a, has a basis. So um, as we all understand that these two, these two strategies as a sort of a common denominator is also, we are facing the threats from the, from the main in China. So um, what we, Taiwan has to want, want to do is that we want to make sure the region is safe. So we have made some purchase of arms sales from the United States to make sure that we can defend ourselves. But at the same time, we also offering that kind of cooperation to make sure the maritime security in the region is good. For example, last year when President Tsai uh, visited uh, Palau and Nauru, that um, we signed a maritime patrol cooperation to, make, to, to have that kind of uh, you know, frequent cooperation in the region to, to, for the safety of the, uh, at the sea. And Taiwan has donated the patrol boats to those two nations. And the third one, of course, is the economy, right? Because of um, the end of the day is trying to help the people of the countries in the region. So I think that Taiwan and US, we can cooperate on that uh, because uh, we allocated 3.1 billion US dollars uh, for the ODA, uh, for the, our South, new Southbound policy. Mm -hmm. and. I, we know that uh, the, in the United States, OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation has also had some kind of a mission to cooperate with the local regional private sector to, to improve the, 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 the area. So um, the, probably the most, uh, um, most immediate best way to to ramp up this cooperation is a US and Taiwan's free trade agreement. If we have that kind of free trade agreement, we can integrate two economies so uh, seamlessly and make it more powerful. We can join together to offer the Pacific Islands a lot more economic development efforts. Um, and now please excuse my ignorance. I probably should know this, but I don't, but do you have a free trade agreement with the US? Is that currently, is that on oh. the cards? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, okay. we, are, we, are, we are trying to, to have that. And I think the both side has an intention to do that. Okay. I know you have one with New Zealand, but <laughs> I yes. was like, oh, <laughs> what's, what's the deal with the US? Uh, one of the things you mentioned there and that, that really helpful readout, thank you, um, saves, me, <laughs> saves me doing the reading. Um, you mentioned the president's uh, visit to Palau and one of the key outcomes from that was the, the new maritime agreement. So I'd be interested to hear sort of more generally about Taiwan's interests in the North Pacific and, and Palau, because that's where you um, were the uh, ambassador most recently, um, but also just sort of generally, um, for example, is the maritime arrangement also with Nauru? Um, yes. And um, I think um, <clears throat> as you probably had known that um, we are trying to all reopen our, we are opening our office in Guam. And that mm -hmm. is really a, an action to show our emphasis in the region. And the, the regional cooperation in, in our uh, the, in Pacific Islands, the Taiwanese approach, uh, we think is important also coincide with the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and our New South, New South Bank policy is to emphasize that there is also a very good um, political and um, good governance elements in it, because it's important. We are, when we are helping the people, we want to make sure that the money, that the benefits go to the people. Let me bring you some, um, usually what we do to, to our, um, uh, and diplomatic allies in the region. Um, in three areas, I would say, agriculture, Taiwanese agriculture in the, in the subtropical uh, and tropical 
technology is one of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. So we offer them to, you know, teach them how to uh, fish, right, and keeping the fish to do it. And medical service, because we have a very strong medical institution over there. So we are helping them to establish their own good institution. And so uh, we, what we I'd like to mention is that we always have kind of a referral program, medical referral program for those um, more serious patients that they, they can go to Taiwan to enjoy our medical system uh, sort of uh, under the national treatment, national status treatment, which means that they pay the same as our citizen pay for our medical curricula. And that's very important. And the third one is education. I think education is so terribly important um, for, for it, it's a the basis of the national development. In Taiwan, if you probably you don't know, it's a 45% of the people aged between 25 to 63 years old are holding the bachelor degrees or higher. So, uh, so this is the basis of for Taiwanese economic development. So uh, we are helping them to do that. We give them a lot of, not only, uh, scholarship, but also uh, a lot of work for uh, seminar or programs inviting them to go to Taiwan to learn. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the areas that we show our sincerity to help the people rather than versus vis-a-vis -vis the Beijing's efforts of the, you know, trying to buy out the, 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 their friendship, their diplomatic relations in the, in the region. I think it's, it's, it's a short-term benefits for the country, but it's long term, it's not going to last long. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, and sticking with this theme, over the last year, uh, Taiwan and the Pacific generally have made headlines uh, in the US and around the world, uh, particularly because of the two diplomatic um, defections, if you will, to PRC in the region. And uh, I was hoping you might uh, speak to uh, some aspect of that, and in particular, sort of the um, um, the flipping of the Solomon Islands and Kiribati. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a sad thing that that kind of thing should happen. I mean, as I mentioned to you, is um, is um, the Chinese are use that kind of uh, you know, big check, check policy, diplomacy is um, that's not the area Taiwan will and willing to compete. Uh, we, are, we are doing our best to help the local people rather than, you know, we're looking at uh, helping their national development under the United Nations uh, sustainable goal, development goal. So it's different scenario, different way of approach, where we think how oh, is the best. Let me bring you one example. The Solomon Islands now, even though they, 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 they changed to, towards Beijing, but their biggest province, Malaita, I think, is trying to you know, pursue their own independence because they are not agree with uh, their federal government's policy. That shows that our a sister in the past decades really helped the grassroots people. They know what's best for them. So um, we are we really, you know, sad to see, sad to see those uh, those two allies went left us last year. But uh, we are hoping that um, the more people understand the two different ways of our diplomatic assistance which is from Beijing or from Taiwan, if they can tell more, and I think we are on the uh, sort of upper hand in the long run. When, I, when it comes to this topic, I will also like to emphasize one thing, is that, the, um, the, that kind of uh, education, education is such terribly important to, uh, in, to let the one country uh, to have a civil society. And that civil society really helped build mm. a long-class mm. democracy. 
And you know, today happens to be the International Day of Democracy, you know, in, in the nation state. And the other week, I read a newspaper, uh, I, I read an article on actually, for, it's, it's um, a junk a senior fellow from the EWC is um, Professor Richard Honey. Uh, he wrote an article um, supposed to be published today, I think. The name is uh, No Democracy Without a Civil Society. And help building a civil society in any country, actually, not only in, in, on those islands, uh, in the Pacific Island nations, in any country, the same. We need to have that kind of uh, more efforts, more transparent to help the NGOs, the media, to help them to, 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 to see what's the ultimate benefits of their own people. I think that's one of the most important ways to help them to have that kind of national development, set up mm -hmm. a good foundation on that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure if, if Richard is watching, he'll be really pleased that you just gave him some free publicity about his paper to come out. So we'll have to make sure I'll have to look at it. I haven't seen it. And, um, and he uh, has spent a, a lot of time living in Asia, working um, some pretty big companies. I believe The Economist, I think, comes to mind. I hope that's right, Rick, if you're watching. Um, and uh, he works with, us, works with us at the center, um, which brings us back to the center and um, when you focused on education being key and I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily know that Taiwan and the East West Center have a very long history um, focused on um, improving opportunities and um, deepening the uh, the education efforts um, and one of the flagship programs is the Pacific Islands Leadership leadership program i should say that probably the pacific islands leadership program which is run by the professional development uh, program at the east west center and that's fully funded by taiwan i got to participate for the first time last year i had i had a fantastic time um i ate so much i could barely <laughs> carry my my body weight but um i wanted to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about pilp about the pacific island leadership program which which has been running i think for eight years Yes, uh, we started the program uh, 2013. It's a five years a term, and we got on the second term now. I think it's important is that the, uh, to help the Pacific Island nations, to help them to, if, if for those uh, young leaders, potential leaders, to set up their network for the purpose of the development of the region. Uh, so, um, we are very happy that you know we have the funding and had the cooperation from the EWC, which is uh, one of the most important uh, think tank institution in, in connection with the Pacific Islands. So um, we started that, and it turned out a very good um, result. And we think not only learning from the books. From, from the classroom, you can really see what the development is really about. So uh, we set up the two, two sort of two stages of the program. Every year, they will come to EWC for, for four to six months, weeks. And then the second half will be going to Taiwan to see what we have been doing in the past. Frankly, uh, Taiwan in the 1950s and 60s, we were one of the most poor countries in the world. We were actually depending on the American foreign assistance from America to, for more than a decade. So now we are, you know, we have the, we are capable to feed back to the international. So this is one of the programs that we are doing it, sharing our experiences with them for the purpose of the development of the Pacific Islands. Uh, so we've got about four minutes to go. And so I'm oh. gonna ask you one, I know time flies when we're just having wow. a chat and having fun. But so I thought I would leave you with this question, um, which is a bit of a doozy. Uh, 
given what we just talked about with Rick's, um, Richard's uh, upcoming piece and sort of one of the underlying tenets of the Pacific Island Leadership Program, which is again to um, reinforce democracy and good governance. I was interested in your views on China's expanding role in the Pacific and, you know, is Taiwan worried? Well, I think, uh, yes, Taiwan, we are worried, but I think all the country, all the free and democratic countries should be worried about that. Because uh, we think uh, what's important thing is that uh, the whole world now we are facing the threats from Chinese, so their model of governance, and which is uh, really anti-freedom and anti-democratic institution. So we are worried about that because if we look at what they are doing in Hong Kong, you know, everybody see from the TV. In Xinjiang, Mengu and Xizang, they are trying to synthesize them, try to make, destroy their own culture, their language, try to make it have only one of the Han, Han dynasties, uh, that kind of um, mindset. And I think it's wrong. So, um, they are trying to sell that and really to the really contradiction to our free and democratic way of living. So we have to protect our, if we want to protect our way of living, our institution, we need to work together to look at what they have done to try to stop them from expanding. Yeah, I uh, thank you for your candor. I really appreciate you coming on today and being willing to sort of ha have this discussion with me. I think one important distinction to make there um, is uh, between the ch Chinese government and the party and of course the, um, the people of China. And um, you and I've had this discussion before and so that's an assumed part of this conversation but I thought it was worth noting here um, that we're discussing international relations. And so at that level, uh, it's important to, to remember the distinction, particularly um, when we're talking to people who, who don't live and breathe that. So thank you again, Michael. I really appreciate your time and um, looking forward to working together in the future. Yes. Aloha. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.